All right, let's review what I was doing. I'm trying to find the magnetic field created by an infinite wire. This time I'm not going to use Ampere's law, which was easy to apply. Now I'm using whose law? I'm using Bio Savar. It's like Bujek Savar, okay? Bio Savar. So that's a terrible joke, but you know what you have to do. Now, let's come back here. What am I doing? I'm trying to use a differential formula, so I need to separate my wire into small parts. And that's exactly what I said. I said, let me get a small part that's x away from my origin and has length dx. And I'd like to cre understand the magnetic field created by this small part at then distance h away from uh, my wire. So right now, it's not r here, it's h. Good. Hmm. First, let's talk about the direction. What's the direction of the magnetic field created by this small part? I know that it's going to be dl cross r hat. Okay. So here's my dl. Which way is r hat? r hat is towards the observation point. So dl cross r hat is into the screen. Does it? Is this observation going to change for any other small part here? If I take a small part on the negative axis, which way will be DL? Up. Which way will be R? It will be towards the observation point. DL cross R, again, into the page. So all these small parts actually create a magnetic field in the same Direction, so I don't have to worry about the direction. So that's good. DL cross R magnitude we have already calculated, and I know that direction of DL cross R is into the page. So I don't have to worry about the vectorial character of the magnetic field here. Great, I'll add up all these small dBs. So let me write this. In more detail now, I have mu zero. I'm just going to write the magnitude. I know it's into the page. What was dl cross r? I said it was dx times sine theta and r square. What's r square? a square plus r square. Well, h square plus x square, I'm sorry. And sine theta is h divided by h square plus x square square root. <coughs> hmm. So what will be the total magnetic field? <coughs> Integral dB. In this case. So it will be mu zero i over 4 pi h over h square plus x square to the 3 halves dx. What are the limits of my integration? x goes from minus infinity all the way up to plus infinity. So that's what I need to do. All right. Good. So let's see. Let me take the constants out. Mu zero i over four pi integral from minus infinity to infinity. I'll also take h out. One over h square plus x square to the three halves dx. How do I evaluate this integral? Let's come on. We have to do a substitution, right? We have to do a trigonometric substitution. It's not going to be too hard. Let's try that. What's the trigonometric substitution? Let me go with the following angle. I'll say 
this angle is, let me call this alpha. And this is x and this is h. So the long side will be h square plus x square square root. Okay. So I'll say tangent alpha is x over h. So 1 plus tangent square alpha d alpha will be 1 over h times dx. All right? In other words, instead of dx, I can write h times. What's 1 plus tangent square alpha? 1 over cosine square alpha times d alpha. So if I'm doing my substitution, hmm, I want to express everything in terms of this uh, alpha now. I have calculated what dx is, but what about h square over x square to the three halves? From here, I can see that h divided by h square plus x square square root is what? Cosine alpha. So what is h square plus x square to one half? It's going to be h divided by cosine alpha. So h square plus x square to the three halves will be h cubed this is divided by cosine cube alpha. So that's what I'm going to do. I'll write 1 over h cube divided by cosine cube alpha. And for dx, now I'm going to write h times 1 over cosine square alpha d alpha. How about the limits? Whenever you're doing a substitution, you should always remember to change the limits. If x goes to plus infinity, what does alpha become? It becomes 90 degrees, right? Pi over 2. So the upper limit is pi over 2. How about the lower limit? If x goes to minus infinity, alpha becomes minus pi over 2. Hmm. Good. So let's cancel some stuff. I have mu 0, i over 4 pi. H's are constants. I have h squared divided by h cube. Integral from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2. Cosine cube alpha, cosine square alpha. They canceled. I'm just left with cosine alpha d alpha. Hmm. What's the integral of cosine alpha? Be careful, minus sine or sine? Just sine alpha. So it's going to be sine alpha from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2. What's sine pi over 2? 1. What's sine minus pi over 2? Minus 1. So this is going to be 1 minus minus 1, which is going to be 2. Overall, this is going to give me mu zero i over four pi h times two. Or let me rewrite this magnetic field is mu zero i over two pi h at a distance h away. Or if the distance is r, not h, I'll call this R now, mu zero i over two pi r. Okay? Let's check. Obviously, it's the same, right? I told you those two laws are equivalent. Now, very much like the Gauss law, you're going to use Ampere's law when there is a lot of symmetry in the system. 
and you're going to use Biosavar law when you actually have to integrate. All right. So let's let's do one more thing. Let's do one more example here. Find the magnetic field created by a circular loop of radius r let me make it capital r carrying current i at its center so here is the question now i don't have to draw it in 3d i have a current loop which has a radius r and is carrying a current i. I would like to find what is the magnetic field at the center. Let's first try to find out the direction. Okay. Now, what was Let's, okay, how do we find out the direction? If I had a current loop, any, I'm sorry, an infinite wire, what kind of magnetic field did it create? It created a magnetic field, field which circles it in the positive sense, right? So if I have my thumb along the current, it creates a magnetic field like my four fingers. Right. So here, if I thought of each section, each small section of I, what kind of magnetic field will it create? I have to put my thumb here. So it will be into the board on this side, but it will be out of the board in the other side. Question. No question? I'm um, come on, there is a question there. We're discussing both the direction. Okay. Let's discuss it together. It's you're not going to get it right the first time. Okay? But if you do it two or three times, it's going to be easy. Think of this small section as if it was an infinite wire. Okay, that's not going to change the direction. And for the infinite wire, what was my rule? If I take my thumb, put it along the current, the sense of the magnetic field is given by my four fingers. Now, on the right hand si right side of the wire, wire, magnetic field is into the screen. On the left side though, it's out of the screen. So at the center, the small part is creating a magnetic field out of the screen. Is this going to change for any other small part? No. Okay. So all the small parts of this wire are actually creating a magnetic field out of the screen. They will add up. Okay. And that will actually give me a third way of using my right hand, a third right hand rule. When I have a current loop, put your four fingers along the sense of current rotation and your thumb tells you which way the magnetic field is pointing. All right? And that's exactly what will happen. The magnetic field will come out of this screen. Good. So I know that the direction of the magnetic field will be towards me at the center. But let's actually calculate it. All right? 
elements calculated. So here is what I'll do. I'll take a small section of this wire at angle theta, which sees a small angle d theta. So that's going to be my dl. So, so here is my dl vector. Can you tell me what is the direction of dl cross r hat? That's exactly what we did. dl is like that. r is from the current to the observation point. So dl cross r is out of the board. So it's OK. We are doing this right. So I need the magnitude of dl cross r. What's the r vector? r vector is from the observation point to the, I'm sorry, from the current to the observation point. So r vector and dl vector are perpendicular to each other. So dl cross r is actually just dl magnitude times r hat magnitude. What is the magnitude of a vector with a hat on it? It's a unit vector. It's always 1. How about dl magnitude? Hmm. It's the length here, right? What's the length? If the angle is d theta, it's going to be r times d theta. Great. Now that I've made sure all small parts create a magnetic field in the same direction, what I can write down is b is going to be just integral db, right? So now I can calculate what db is. db is mu0 i over 4 pi dl cross r hat divided by r square. What's this small r? It was the distance from the current to the observation point. Here, it's always going to be capital R. Right? All my currents are at the same distance from my observation point. So instead of small r square, I'll just write capital R square. All right? DL cross r hat, I have just calculated. I'm going to calculate the magnitude here. It's going to be mu0 i over 4 pi r times d theta divided by r square. r's will cancel. Good. So what will be the total magnetic field? It's going to be integral db. Integral mu0 i over 4 pi 1 over r d theta. What are the limits of my integration? I'll start integrating from zero angle. I'll go back. I'll go full circle. I'll go from zero to 2 pi. How am I going to evaluate this integral? Yes, it's theta, right? So <laughs> mu zero i over 4 pi r. Nothing depends on theta. This is the simplest integral in the world. This is just theta from 0 to 2 pi. So which is 2 pi, right? So the end result is mu zero i over 2 r. And the direction is into the page. No, it's out of the page. I'm trying to see if you, you guys, I mean, it's almost 5, so you should be sleeping, right? And you are sleeping, trying to wake you up out of the page. Hmm. Let me solve one more example. OK. And then we'll be done with today's lecture. I've been talking as if all my wires are infinitesimally thin. So all the current is going through just a point in space. OK. So let's see if this is a good assumption or a bad assumption. Let's calculate the magnetic field created by a thick wire. All right. So here is what I'll do. I'll actually say that 
I have an infinite wire that has radius r. A thick wire of radius r carries a total current I <coughs> uniformly through its cross section. Calculate the current density. Find the magnetic field outside the wire. And finally, find the magnetic field inside the wire. All right. Hmm. Let's start from the first part. Do you remember what was the definition of current density? That's right. It should be current divided by the cross-sectional area. So if I actually draw a cross-section of this figure, what will I see? I'll actually C, just a circle where current is basically coming towards me. This is current density J. And it's coming uniformly. So J is total current I divided by the total cross sectional area. So if this is R, it's going to be pi r square, so that's going to be my part A answer. How about the magnetic field outside the wire? Hmm. Well, clearly this is a very symmetric system. So, which one should we use? Should we use Biot-Savart law or Ampere's law? Ampere's law seems very well suited here. So here is what I'll do. I'll choose an Amperian loop at a distance r away. Or maybe. I'll. So this will be my Amperian loop with the following sense. I'll like to calculate integral b dot dl. And I know that it's going to be mu zero times i in. So can you tell me what is the total current passing through this loop? All the current is passing through this Amperian loop. So this is going to be I, in zero I. How about B dot DL? I know that each piece of small current density J is creating a magnetic field in the same direction. So by symmetry, I know that my magnetic field is going to follow this circle. Okay. And because this system is infinite, I know that there is no out of plane component. Up is as good as down. So what I'll do is, I'll say B is parallel to DL at each point of my path. Just like the things I did for Gauss's law, right? So here's what I'll do. I'll say that B is parallel to DL, so I'll take B out of the integral and write this as integral DL. And now this is just 2 pi r. No, it's not 2 pi r. Where am I doing my integral over? I'm doing my integral over the Amperian loop, which has a radius of not capital R, 
but smaller. Be very careful here. Okay. So this is the total circumference, total length of my Amperian loop. Hmm. So the magnetic field magnitude is apparently mu zero i over two pi r if I am outside. Is that different from what I found? I'm sorry. Is that different from what I found for a thin wire? No, it's not different. That's good. So the thickness of the wire doesn't matter as long as you're outside the wire. Okay, that sort of makes sense. Good. Now, how about inside the wire? Let me plot, try to plot my figure again. So again, as a cross section, I have my current uniformly coming towards me. So this is my current density. <coughs> now I'll apply Ampere's law, but now I'll actually use an Amperian loop which has a radius r smaller than the wire's thickness. So integral b dot dl is again going to be mu zero times i in. And again, the symmetry has not changed at all. Up down symmetry, rotational symmetry is still here. So here I can write this with the assumption that B is parallel to DL. So it's actually going to give me integral B integral DL magnitude, which is going to be 2 pi smaller. So the left hand side is B times 2 pi R. How about I in though? What is I in here? Is all the current passing through my small loop, my Amperian loop? No. And that's going to make a difference. So I in here, it's going to be J, current density, times the area of my Amperian small loop, J times pi R square, or it's going to be I times pi R square divided by pi capital R square. And it does make sense. This is basically the ratio of my small loop to the total cross section of the wire times the current. Okay. Hmm. So it is going to be mu zero i r square over r square. So b magnitude is going to be mu zero i over two pi r divided by capital R square if r is less than r. Hmm. So if I plot the magnitude of the current as a function of the distance from the origin, on the outside it will fall as 1 over r. But on the inside it will actually rise linearly. So where is the magnetic field maximum exactly on the surface of the wire. Does it make sense if I'm sitting exactly at the center of the wire, which way should the magnetic field point? No way. I mean, there is really, it cannot point in any direction. It must be zero. All the small magnetic fields created by small currents will cancel at the center. So at the center, it does make sense that I have zero magnetic field. Okay. So if I actually want to, you know, plot this, magnetic field is smaller on the inside. It gets larger exactly on the surface. It always has the same sense of rotation. And on the outside, it's again getting smaller. And what's the maximum amount? The maximum amount, both formulas give me the same thing. It's going to be mu zero 
i over 2 pi r. Right. Now, all the tricks we did for Gauss's law, like non-uniform charge distributions, I don't know, other kinds of symmetry, like planar symmetry, okay? All of them can be adopted to Ampere's law. So be careful, okay? Furthermore, Again, here you have to be careful whether you should use Ampere's law or Biot-Savart's law to calculate the magnetic field. <coughs> so, on Saturday, what I'll do is I'll try to solve in the first hour as many examples as possible showing you how one can calculate magnetic fields for different current distributions. All right. And then, in the remaining two hours, I'll talk about other uh, things related to magnetic field. All right. I'll see you on Saturday. <laughs>